So let's see if the Ragavan does the job on turn one. Again, this is not exactly how I expected to play Magic, but... It's a pretty demoralizing first turn to face. We also have the Torpor Orb, which annihilates Rusko as well. And a Quench. Quench Tucky Fried Chicken. Okay, so we've got turn one oppression, turn two stops the Rusko. Um, what more could we possibly do to stop Rusko players here? <laughs> Rather amusingly. Blue and black. Okay. What have we got? What you got for me? If they do nothing, oh my god, they are doing literally nothing. Well, that means we get bonus here. I mean, we could go absolutely evil and abrade the Cold Steel Heart. Do we just do that? Or do we just go for the abrade? To be fair, this could be our only window. Would be our only window. <clears throat> and they, even if they have four mana for the, the Rusko, is, what's they going to do? It's just a 3-3 three, three at that point, no clock. Rusko without a clock is considerably worse. It's a two-step process. There's now three threats on our field they must eradicate, but they can't do them all at once. So they do nothing at all. That's very suspicious indeed. And we have two spells we can use to intervene here. Man, they're getting shredded. But again, it's Palkyu, no so there's no mercy. This is where the big boys play. Well, their punishment will be severe. Okay, we lose poor old Ragavan. Bitter downfall. Realistic cast if it targets a creature. There's no ETBs, I'm afraid. They forgot that part again, I believe. Not again, but. River's Rebuke. Absolutely shredding Let there. Your weak minds crumble. Yeah, we'll pay three. <clears throat> Okay, what else have they got left? Some unconventional cards for Rusko, I have to say. So here comes Rusko, just vanilla. Absolutely love to see it. Let's see how else we can just torment them. Whatever. Oh, this feels like a very fresh Rusko. As in, like, a lot of the cards aren't they're not tuned to the worst thing they could possibly be. Not like up my deck, which is pure agony to face. You know what's weird? I've not seen many bonus mirrors, which means no one respects it. Oh, and there you go. Ladies and gentlemen. Systematically destroying every Rusko player I meet. Hello guys, today I'm revisiting Nico Bola's Dragon Guard. Now, I've done this a few times, and it's probably because it's my favourite Hell Cube deck. And yeah, it's a Hell Cube video, so keep that in mind. I wanted to also celebrate the fact I've done about 500 videos now, so that's quite uh, an achievement. And I've also had about a million views on the channel, which is all just incredible when you think about the, the just the sheer number of times people have clicked my videos. I think in total, people have viewed my videos for more than like 15 years worth of time which is really absurd as well so i just wanted to kind of do a video which celebrates me as a player and as a channel what really encompasses me as mtg josh there's a lot of creators out there but what makes me unique i don't know we'll see i think for me it definitely is grixis kind of tap out control 
And what is tap out control? Well, a lot of control decks normally are. If we go back to the five mana Teferi here of Dominaria, you kind of want to leave mana up all the time and stop everything your opponent's doing. But that's not my style of playing. Firstly, it's very defensive. Secondly, it kind of breeds, uh, well, a pretty toxic style of player. And also, counter spells aren't just, they're not always good if that's the only thing you're doing. We do have counters in this deck, but they're a lot more tact tactically positioned. And there'll be reasons for them being in the deck. And uh, what I wanted to do in this deck tech, so I wanted to make the deck tech a bit longer than usual because I wanted to really explain the reasoning behind as many cards as possible in the deck. I don't normally do this. I normally skim over every single card. But essentially, this is the longest deck I've had in service. Played at the most. This is kind of like my go-to deck when I just want to, weirdly enough, um, kind of defragment my mind and just chill out. I know it's weird. It's held you, but there is a really big cathartic feeling from annihilating Hell Q. And I'm not just saying that. I've won a lot of games with this deck. And it's for a number of reasons, which hopefully I can explain. Uh, at first, I didn't really want to show people this deck list because I don't really want to face it myself. But eh, it is what it is. You can see the deck list here. I'm in two minds about actually posting it or not. Um, I think... If enough people want to see it in text form, I will post a deck list below. But I'm just starting to wonder, there's a couple of things when I show a deck list. Number one, do people actually, how many people actually download the deck list? Tell me below, because it's just an extra step for me that I can avoid if people actually don't do it. I don't have a way of really keeping record of how many people actually appreciate the deck list. Nobody really says anything. Secondly, this is a bit more uh business oriented um concerning my audience but maybe it would be better if i left the, the ease of deck techs for people in my discord because then i'd know for a fact if people wanted it then people in my discord would ask me and then i'll post it in a channel on a discord let me know how you feel about those things i know that second one doesn't sound so great reducing the public deck list like literally not having the deck list on the youtube channel at all make it a bit more exclusive, then it makes people want to join the Discord more and have a reason to actually be in the community. But, you know, these decks take a lot of work and most of my viewers just come on by and leave and that's it and that's the end of the, the transaction. But, you know, I kind of want to make it like a reward. <clears throat> and, uh, I don't know, just an interesting concept I want to test. Probably it's not going to go in too well, but, you know, at the end of the day, I'm doing this for... It's mostly for me, but I kind of want to get a reward out of myself. You know, I'm not just all about giving. I, I need to get something back in return. And if that's Patreon accounts or Kofi donations, I don't know. I'm just I'm just testing the waters right now. Oh, well, we'll see. But ignore that bit if you're not interested in, in that stuff. Let's go through the deck list and let's see why I've chosen each card. And I can actually do that with this deck. I can talk about pretty much the reason why everything is in the deck. Because I've played this, there's a lot hundreds upon hundreds of games with this so let's start from the beginning okay pact of negation i don't normally have this in commander decks unless the commander costs five or greater the reason for that is you want to be able to resolve your dick or bolus without them getting counted on the same turn you cast him and when you cast him you're probably going to be on curve so five mana you're not going to have any mana open so pact allows you to do that on curve or earlier without disruption for your opponent as long as you have five active mana next turn you'll be able to uh, resolve this unhindered. Obviously, that's dangerous if you've got mana rocks out, like an arcane signet, and your opponent knows that Pact requires double blue. If they then kill it, then you're in trouble. But just be cautious. Hopefully, you have five actual lands out. Dark Ritual, pretty self explanatory. Burst you out the gates. It's probably a card that shouldn't be legal in the format because it, it is very aggressive and it can lead to explosive turn one plays like Liliana the Veil, vale, Black Market Connections. Those are the worst things you can really face. <clears throat> if you see a Lily or Black Market Connections on turn one, then it's, it's quite demoralizing. Um, duress, again, Duress and Thoughtseize are there to just investigate your opponent's hand and get rid of a big counter or threat. These are, we have two of these because one just isn't enough. And I wouldn't go for too many more because then you're going to spend your whole game looking at your opponent's hand getting rid of their threats, but then things slip through the net, and then if your opponent's got aggressive curve, they're hitting you with their small stuff anyway. Uh, 
So you can overload on discard, so just be cautious. Fatal push. I really don't see this nearly enough, and it's just bewildering. This kills so many things in the format, and if you don't have turn one removal, your deck's terrible, essentially, because you're facing Ragavan. The fact that Ragavan exists in the format, I'm talking about Hellcute exclusively here, means that if you don't deal with him and when they go first, you're screwed. So we have Fatal Push for that job. We also have Lightning Bolt, and we have Galvanic Discharge. But Fatal Push specifically is great, because <clears throat> if you combine this with a treasure being sacrificed or one of your uh, fetch lands going in the bin, like Bloodstained Mire, for instance, then you can actually kill a four-mana creature. What's a four-mana creature? Rusko. Rusko and anything beneath that. So one to four mana. You've got a good gamut there of what you can kill with it or push. Galvanic Discharge is a recently new one. and just goes to show how kind of OP Modern Horizons 3 is. It's, uh, it's basically another copy Lightning Bolt. It doesn't hit players, but who cares? It's not like lightning bolt is going to be winning too many games by hitting them in the face but yeah lightning bolt is there as well obviously this, can, this is like the best red spell of all time pretty much but discharge is also good for another reason you can also feign um oh sorry wobbly noise there you can also feign this spell so what do i mean by that you target something with galvanic discharge but you don't pay any energy at all until th this is on the stack and it's going to about to resolve. So what you can do is if if you target something with this, and then someone gives their creature a toughness boost, that means that you can't kill it with three damage. Or they do. There's a lot of ways to interrupt this. Then you can just pay no energy at all. But then that energy can go towards. There's a few other things you can actually put it towards. But in the deck we have a solar transformer, which is a second arcane signet, which is actually really good because it comes in. It comes in tapped, which is which is bad, but it also adds colorless and it adds one mana and many color for energy. So this only has three energy to start with, but with Galvanic Discharge, you may get a few more taps out of it. And the format's only four, five, six turns anyway, so the Transformer will probably last you as long as you need to. So don't underestimate this, another new card. There's so many Modern Horizons 3 cards that have impacted the format. It's, it's really wild. And then you've got Ragavan, which is the best red aggro creature in the whole game. Uh, it's interesting how I said Lightning Bolt's the best red card because it kills Ragavan and Ragavan's the best red creature. I don't know. They're probably in contention for best red card. It's hard to say, but Bolt deals with Ragavan, so Bolt is better in that regard. But yeah, Ragavan, if you resolve this turn one, the amount of concessions you'll get is... I would say it's good, but you, you want to have a game. And Ragavan and Dark Ritual just really do not need to exist in the format. They're just too powerful. And, and that's coming from someone who's using them. You know, I'm only using them because they're necessary necessarily evil for Hellcube and you will need them to survive. And then one copy of Strike It Rich, which is just really incredible in non-green decks. If you're using green, do not use this. You've got Mana Dorks, Mana Owls, but yeah, Strike It Rich is just really wonderful. There's a few other contemporary uh, alternative choices. You've got Goldhound, which is a one red haste dog, which, uh, sorry, I don't think it has haste, but you can tap it for one red. But that goes away, and that's done, and it can be killed as well, which is risky. Strike It Rich... Treasure in turn one. Turn two, you can do those crazy things we just said. Liliana of the Veil, vale, Black Market Connections. So they're the one drops I would highly recommend considering. I'm never going to say 100% use it because everyone's different, but yeah, those are the one drops I would consider using. Okay, on to the two CMC creatures. Now there's a bit of a pattern here with the creatures in the deck. And that's all because it's, it's jumping a little bit ahead because I'm going to do CMC uh, going up to, to six. The reason there's a few blue creatures in the deck is because of the brand new Flare of Denial. Now, this is a straight up counter spell for three, which is very boring and, to be honest, very bad. However, if you sacrifice a non token blue creature, this is zero mana and it can be incredibly off putting for your opponent and it will get them literally out of nowhere. It's almost like having a second copy of Pact, but you won't be paying five in your next turn. So, people might be questioning why this is in the deck because it's very situational in a deck that only has. 12 creatures, and my commander is a planeswalker, and it doesn't work with tokens. Well, it I've just made it work. It just kind of works, right? So we have Baral, which is a blue creature. Malcolm, blue creature. Adelian, Hex Catcher. We have Tishana's Tidebinder, Brazen Borrower, and Vendillion Cleek. So there's about six creatures there that can be sacrificed for the Flare of Denial to make a zero. So keep that in mind when I'm talking through these blue creatures, and then you might realise why or what 
the, the reason they're in the deck. But yeah, that's essentially, they're all here for Flare of Denial. But the first one, Burrell. This is a fantastic decoy spell. Mainly because, so what's a decoy spell? It's a spell you put out to make your opponent panic and make them think, oh crap, they need to t take this down or it'll be the end of the game, right? Burrell does a few things. Firstly, his reputation precedes him. When you see Burrell, people shit themselves, including me, if it's the commander, because you know you're in for a treat. A counter tribal deck is normally what Burrell's used, but that isn't our deck. It's just, it's just a decoy. And I think that's where my deck building really does get go up a few steps from a lot of other creators. You'll notice a lot of other creators kind of do things very, it's very WYSIWYG, which is what you see is what you get. You just do it and that's it. You know, a rock is a rock is a rock. But this deck, there's things in here to offset your opponent's expectations, which is really powerful. Psychology is hugely powerful. We, on this channel, I always say, why the hell do they play that? As soon as I say that, you'll notice that it throws me off. We want to do the same to our opponents. We want our opponent to feel confused. Burrell is not bad in the deck, but the second paragraph which says whenever you counter a spell, you loot, that's a bit we're really not going to focus on. He's really there for a decoy and for Flare of Denial. But yeah, once the opponent sees this, they're going to use valuable resources on this because nobody wants to see Burrell. Everyone in Hell is so used to playing uber fast counter control decks. So they, they will have the memory of this alone will be enough to kill him and then it will protect your other things, which is useful. Next up, Confederate Conundrum. This is the best blue cantrip of all time in Hell I might make a separate video about the reason to use certain cards like this, but honestly, people really turn up their nose at these cards and it it's funny because. It makes my deck stronger. No one's used to seeing this. It's very rare to see opponents using the cards I've chosen. And, you know, I've played Magic a long time. Most of my decks, when they're designed, are designed to take out a particular threat. Once I've played the deck long enough, like I've played Helky a long time. And I know people love to freaking ramp like no tomorrow. So when you see loads of Pox or any Green X decks ramping, the amount of fetch lands people have now is crazy. When this is out, people will not be fetching in oh there's a freaking moth on my face um people won't be fetching in your turn so you're gonna delay it so they'll be doing it in your turn instead but this really changes the cadence of the game if someone scape shifts with confound and conundrum out they will return all the lands to the hand if they would have played one this really screws up a lot of decks and i've seen people straight up concede just from playing this now the irony is i'm, re I'm re releasing all this deck tech now and people might see it and think Okay, well, I'll build around it. But my channel is in an interesting spot where it's very small. So it's a very niche channel, to be honest. So I'll only be affecting the people long enough to actually stay and watch this part, which is, to be honest, not very many of you. So if you're watching this, you feel privileged because you're basically getting a free tutorial for someone who's played the game for over 14 years, um, which is something you don't see that often. You will see pros on social medias and stuff, but they just won't really explain the stuff. They're just, they're very kind of self serving you know but I'm, I'm here to teach you so put this on your blue decks honestly there's no downside it's literally two mana draw a card with upside i mean w you know it stops green decks when you play a park you'll see what i mean you'll, you'll really slow them down cyclone rift <clears throat> this is a really boring card again but that's what Hell is there's going to be a lot of boring cards but it's just a necessary evil it's the seven mana version of river's rebuke instant speed if you've played Magic for a while, you'll know how crazy this is. This will reset the game for you and make sure that you have a chance of coming back. It's a necessary evil. It's fine. You know, just when someone leaves seven mana up and passes, just think about this card. Malcolm, anything with flash is going to help a control deck. And this is no exception. It can block something. It can pressure opponents' planeswalkers. It can lure out a counter spell. This is so crazily good, honestly. It's it's kind of absurd how good this two drop is. And then when it hits, you get to loot, draw discard. On the fourth time you do that, you can cast something for free that you discard. I once did this today. I played Bellis Set for free. Obviously, you had to hit him four times, but you know, it's just it's good to have something that pressures you early as well, because as I said with Burrell, it it kind of lures out your opponent's kill spells, and if they're killing your early stuff, your later stuff survives. Search for a scanter. This is a very particular filtering card that I probably wouldn't recommend for faster decks that are trying to kill with damage. But for slower decks like Bolas, like this, I would recommend, just because the filtration is great, you need triple black, blue, red to cast him. 
So you want to make sure you get the right mana. And this is just great. And then it flips, and then you can fight off a opposing control deck. Um, and it's just it's just really good at, at fighting opposing control decks once it's flipped. It's, you'll find a lot of people want Exile Graveyard and take this out before it flips. Vidalian Hatchcatcher. This is a really random card as well. But again, it's got the flash. It's a blue creature, which means it works with Flare Tunnel. And it will throw your opponent off so much. So I, you know, I once played this today. Yeah, today I played a lot with this deck. And somebody just conceded because they knew they couldn't resolve anything because they had three mana. <clears throat> and when people are mana screwed, this will just absolutely wreck them. It has no synergy with any other card in the deck, apart from, weirdly enough, Black Market Connections, because you're making changelings, which means that the, the hatch catcher will make them bigger. But, you know, that's beside the point. It's just a blue creature that prevents your opponent resolving their spells. Um, and it's just really crazy. It's it's much better than you think. And the fact that it's Flash, it, it's, it makes a world of difference. Mana Drain. I don't really think Mana Drain should be in the format either. This deck is kind of built up of cards that shouldn't be in the format, so everyone's abusing them and using them, because why not? No one's stopping you. It is it is very good, but I'd say it's much better Mono Blue, because the main issue is it doesn't help us cast Bolas. So keep that in mind. This contradicts the norm. People normally cast this, the next turn they play a big spell. Bolas is five solid pips. Mana Drain gives you... X colorless. The only way this helps is if your bonus has got an incredible tax added to the end because it's been stopped twice or thrice, and then Drain will be able to help you. In fact, all the color pips in our deck are very intense on black. That's why you'll notice there's a lot more swamps than the other basics. Um, the other lands are kind of equal in uh, sharing the colors. You can see here that the spread of colors, 26 black pips in the deck so that's a lot of black so the mana drain it's good it will slow them down it's a stop counter spell with upside uh there's only one big colorless card in the whole deck ether flux we'll get to that but you can cast that for free if that happens to be in hand everything else will require a lot more color pips bitter triumph i think this is probably the best black removal spell they've ever made which is a concerning sentence because all of this stuff came out like this year um, or more recently and it, it's just kind of crazy how power creep just every deck is just the new cards the reason this is so good there's no downside right if we look at power word kill you can't kill angels demons devils or dragons but for two mana this is still ex excellent and mono black normally has a downside with removal of two mana kill something but not something else like go for the throat you can't kill um, artifact creatures, Doomblade, you can't kill black creatures. Um, and then we went to Infernal Grasp, kill any creature, lose two. Now we're on Bitter Triumph, kill any creature or Planeswalker, discard a card or pay three, which is so like, meh, anyway, like three life is just like, eh, whatever, who cares? It's just so good. And now in the Bloomborough set, which is about to come out, um, they've got two mana, kill a creature, two mana, sorcery. No downside. So there we go. That's the evolution. I mean, we're probably going to get to one black mana soon, but that is why I like Fatal Push, because this occupies a really epic place in Magic right now. But it's not just like straight up BS. You have to go through a hoop. And hoops are what makes the game interesting. It what makes It's what makes the game work. And I, rather ironically, in the back of the artwork of Fatal Push are cogs. And that is what I like to spin in my own head. But, you know, a lot of people don't. So yeah, Bitter Triumph, it's just the best. Kills the creature or walker. It's kind of unbelievable how good this is. Uh, but there we go. Feed the Swarm, much needed enchantment removal in Grixis. <coughs> Grixis cannot normally do that. We can bounce a few things. Red is screwed versus enchantments, but black can strap, kill him. Feed the Swarm, still pretty much the premier way of doing that. So keep that in. Grasp, as I said before. Kills any creature, lose two life. Again, there's a few ways to lose life in the deck, but man, I mean, the turns, the game's going to be over very soon anyway, so who cares? Power word kill. This is the one I'm kind of umming and ahhing about. I'm not that sure if I should keep it in because I keep coming across bloody dragons. Uh, never angels, never demons, never devils, though. Always dragons. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It could just be due to my KD, my win rate, whatever. I do seem to have a lot of matches against 
attracts her. This won't kill her. So maybe this is a bad card. But for now, uh, it's fine. It's fine. A braid. It's lightning bolt against the things that matter, creatures. And it just throws out a fact, which is great against the opponent's signets. So that's going to stay in. This has also killed so many big artifacts. It kills Citadel. Like, you know, a braid, a braid is just is, is so good. A braid and Feed Swarm, they are a uh, happy couple. Lovely, happy couple. Magda, there was a lot of iterations of Bolas where I didn't include creatures that tapped four treasures because people would just kill them and then the story would be it. That would be done. I'd rather use Signet. Now, things have changed. Again, <clears throat> it's all about having decoy spells. You play a Magda, people think, oh no, they're going to tutor uh, something crazy from the deck, a dragon artifact, kill it with fire. And that's exactly what people do. And it just reduces the threats going against your other stuff. And that's good. You need stuff to pull the fire away. You can't have a deck with one creature and 60 spells. It ain't going to work because all the kill spells are going to go to your creature. That is advanced deck building. That's stuff that people don't think about. Hell of a lot. Even people I've known for years. I know people that have played for decades that do not understand priority, target assessment, and the importance of killing the right thing. They just really need to do, la, 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 do this and wonder why they lose. And it's just kind of sad, really. And uh, it's a learning curve. But yes, put things in your deck that you don't mind losing. That's a strange thing to say, isn't it? But put stuff in your deck that it's strong. It's decent if it works, but it doesn't work. It's fine. It's not part of the main thing. It distracts your opponent. So that goes to Magda. That goes to Baral. That goes to Malcolm. All these random things. Even Vidalian Hexcatcher to some extent. Moving on to Mana Ramp. So Arcane Signet. <clears throat> we all know why this is in the deck. It's two mana accelerant, which is really good. Same with Cold Steel Heart. Notice we don't have any of the ones that just tap for colours because well, just for colours. Like Mindstone and the other ones. Because Bolus is look at this. Bolus is three separate pip colours and three black. It's so intensive. You cannot afford to slip up. Look at my mana base. Not a single land that taps the colours. That's the thing I've noticed a lot as well. Just get over it. Just put in colour mana sources. If you've got a tri-colour commander, do not risk putting colourless lands in. It's just too risky. Of course you do you, but your win rate will probably drop. <clears throat> I mean, it's fine if you just if you want to do it for fun, but I have a feeling that if you're watching this far, you want to win, right? And that's fine because we all do. That's you know, spoiler alert. Um, so got the arcane signet. Cold Steel Heart, Solar Transformer, I really like because it's basically, it's like Cold Steel Heart, basically, but you get three taps out of it, which is, as I said, the game's probably going to be over by then. And by the time you run out of energy, bolus, you'll have enough mana to, you'll, you should probably have enough mana from your other mana sources to pay for bolus's color cost. And then Solar Transformer can just pay for the command attacks, which is still fine. And don't forget that the Galvanic Discharge, which is Lightning Bolt 2, Gives you additional energy towards that as well. I know it's niche. You can actually put more energy in, but I think these are the best thing, like instances I can find. Now, we're getting into some really, really spicy tech now. So if you like it's, this video so far, don't forget to drop a like, subscribe. But now we're moving on to Torpor Orb. The reason this deck obliterates the meta. Right, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of decks this annihilates. So, Rusko. Atraxa. Itali. Now, that's three names, but that's pretty much most of Halky, right? There's a lot more that Torpor Orb stops. It stops a lot. Um, it stops a lot of Green X decks with abilities that hit the field. Your Rock decks. There's so many ETBs in the game. Now, bear in mind, we also have ETBs in the deck, but I'm never under the mindset to exclude things just because your deck does it, and that's how you need to kind of break out of this deck building shtick making constraints i keep seeing people in people always say oh why this why that but if you always use the same stuff then you're never going to explore and i explore all the time for different solutions now torpor orb does stop tishana's tide binder and it also stops rusko but you're not always going to draw them you're not always going to draw them and it's like a safety net right would you rather have a torpor orb and a useless Tishana's Tidebinder, or no Torpor Orb and an active Tidebinder when your opponent has an Atali deck. It's it's a necessary thing to, to have, and I think it's fantastic. It doesn't 
even stop us that much. Like two or three cars on deck are affected. But even if a Rusko comes down and doesn't get his clock, still drains you for one each spell. Still decent. So yeah, Torpor Orb, absolute all-star in this deck, especially Halky, which is littered with ETBs. You know, if you face an Alish Norn deck, you will screw them over 100% because can't beats can. And if you say can't and someone says you can twice, you still beat him twice. So bear in mind, you probably won't face Alish Norn with this deck because it is exclusively Halky um, and you'll see ridiculously powerful things. But weirdly enough, Alish Norn's on there. She's probably tier one, but yeah, it's mono white, Alish Norn and just, yeah, whatever. Next up, even more controversial, Winter Moon. Now look how many non-basics we have in our deck. We have a shed load. Now, when this first came out, <coughs> I initially thought magic is dead, but I've not seen it much. And I don't really think magic is dead, by the way. I just think magic is getting more painful to play <coughs> until I evolved. So Winter Moon, this screws up five colors so hard. You can only untap one non-basic. It's just so good. Now, this is a self-destruct button because it will screw you over two. I would only, only ever play this if it was in your hand. If, 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 if you were desperate and you wanted to stop your opponent. Against mono decks, it ain't going to do anything. But, you know, there's ways to get rid of it. You could, like, cycle it away with the Malcolm, or you can cycle it away with the um, Bitter Triumph, discard it. There's a few ways. You don't have to play it. You can just have it in your hand. Your opponent might be curious. They use the Thoughtseize. They might want to get rid of it because they're terrified of what it's going to do. Again, very psychological. There's Thoughtseize everywhere in this format. Opponent sees this. It's highly likely they get rid of it if it's, if it's something that they think is going to affect them, especially prismatic bridge decks. So keep that in mind. Spiteful Banditry, fairly new addition to the deck. There is a Meat Hook Massacre, but I'm less bothered about the drain effect and more interested in the ramp. Because if I'm getting some incidental ramp, uh, you're just going to cast both to turn earlier, which is just wonderful. So if you've never seen this before, X damage each creature on enchantment, which is kind of cool. And whenever one or more creatures your opponent's control die, you get a treasure. It triggers once each turn. It's a mythic for a reason. It doesn't look very mythical, does it? But honestly, it's really great for ramping a little bit as well. Rhystic Study, old school classic card. You know, it's just annoying to face, isn't it? I hate facing this. I hate the triggers it gives you, but, you know, if you can annoy your opponent, you've got a high chance of winning. It's super fantastic card. Tidebinder, <clears throat> a bit more tech that obviously synergizes with Flare of Denial, as we just said. This can stop so many things. Um, I used this early today on someone's fetch land, and I think I might have pissed them off. So they cracked a fetch land, which isn't a mana ability, by the way, and they didn't search the deck for anything, which is just hilarious. This stops an activated or triggered ability, and if this is on the battlefield, when it, you know, when it, as long as it's on the battlefield at the same time as that card, they will never be able to use those abilities again, which is so funny. Because then they have to use the whole uh, room of spell to kill her and blah de blah. She's such a powerful card. And again, Merfolk, you know, even synergizes with the hex catcher a little bit. I forgot about that. Can give her a power boost. You can then sacrifice the Tidebinder in response to maybe get rid of an opponent's thing. Honestly, the synergy in this set is beautiful. It's so well kind of constructed, if I say so myself. Next up, Brazen Borrower. It's just super good. Bounce spell and a 3 1 flyer. Everyone uses this, I think. This is such a highly regarded card. It's just one of the best removal spells of all time. You know, it's it's just very difficult to overstate how great this design is. And it feels fairly balanced as well. Two mana bounce, three mana flyer, split up into two parts. It's just it's just incredible. The only downside is it can only block flyers, but ah, that's fine. And then we come to Flare of Denial, which we've already talked about. You know why it's in here already. Unless you've skipped, then maybe go back. Narset, incredible card. It stops so many things. The latest thing I stopped with this was last March of the Ents, which for some reason they cast with this out and it stopped them drawing seven cards and uh, they quit. So Narset, it's just, it's just, I love, a lot of people hate the toxicity of War Spark Walkers, but I love the way they all stop people just abusing the game. Exactly what she does, helps you draw two cards. Stops your opponent drawing extra cards. Stops Sithis decks. Stops so many decks. Stops opponents Nickel Bolas decks if you're doing the mirror. It's just wonderful. On to Vendillion Clique. <clears throat> this is a recent edition as well. Again, I just wanted a few more flashy things in the deck to just annoy our opponents. 
It's blue, which means it works a flare of denial. It looks at somebody's hand, gets rid of a card, and then puts it into the deck, and then they draw a new one. It's risky if... It, it depends what they have, right? I would say 50% of the time, I don't even use the ability. But just looking in the hand is strong enough. And don't forget, you could do it on your own hand as well if you want to just get a new card. It's so versatile. There's a reason this used to be used in modern. Um, it's so good. It's very advanced, though. I, it's hard to kind of really state the power of this card because to a newer player, which might be yourself or someone you know, it doesn't look that good, does it? I understand it doesn't look that good. But the nuance of it is super fascinating to me. You know, the amount of times I've played this and just looked and thought, no, I'm not going to put a non land card um, on the bottom of the opponent's library. I'm just going to leave it. And then they don't draw a card. They only draw a card if you do that. So it's just great. It's a surprise attacker, surprise blocker, precious planeswalkers, which is really good. And it, it's just wonderful. I'm in love with this card. So nice. Black Market Connections. You all know what this is. It's just crazily powerful. does everything. Phyrexian Arena is something that I recently took out because I felt like it was a bit too slow. And it drained us a bit too much. And I feel like you might as well just have the upgraded version of Black Market. It's just better in every single way. Hard to believe this is two and black, whereas Phyrexian Arena is one black black. That is something I will never really understand. But there we go. Elspeth's Nightmare. This is a mini planeswalker. Barely see it used. Kill something. Basically, duresses your opponent's hand and, and Bajuka bugs at graveyard. It's three things in one. I regularly use this without a target for phase one. Just get out there versus control. People actually counter this because they don't want to reveal their hand. Once you reveal your hand, game's over sometimes. Toxic Deluge. What a card. Best removal, best board wipe in the game by far. Three mana board wipe. The reason it's the best is because it deals with Nardu decks super well. You will pay four life to deal with all their stuff, but... Hexproof ain't going to do shit versus this. And if you're struggling against Nardu, just put Toxic Delusion on your decks. Perfectly fine. Same with Lillian on the Veil. Deals to Nardu. They, the Hexproof means shit versus this. You know, turn one, you go Dark Ritual into Liliana, and that's it. It's just game over. If that's what you're aiming for, put it in. Brotherhood's End. I've got so many anecdotes to all these cards, but recently I used this and I killed three rocks. That was really good. So it kills all their little rocks or all their little creatures. Either way, this is great. Especially when I keep facing Kinnon decks. And Kinnon loves to go low to the ground. Loads of mana dorks. This annihilates everything. Super good. Only downside is double red. A bit tricky to cast sometimes. At Shiok Dream Runner. This is something that you never ever see as well. <laughs> you notice my deck is designed to really just be a scalpel against certain threats, and this might not work as well against lower tier decks, really enough, but against higher tier, this is incredible. Firstly, the first sentence nobody ever, 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 ever remembers, and I've got people with this so many times, and they will just quit the game. Spells and abilities your opponents control can't cause them to search their library. Do you know how many cards in the game involve searching? There are a shitload. Most of them fetch lands. Everyone and their mother uses all 50,000 fetch lands in their bloody monocolor decks now. Uh -uh, you ain't doing shit with that shock out. Oh, you want to demonic tutor? No, you're not going to do that. Oh, you want to use uh, escape shift? No, you're not going to search. This stops so many things. And combined with Confetti Conundrum, they can't use extra ramp like Cultivates. And Ashok stops on searching as well. So you've got two, you've basically got two hardcore ways to stop green. If you're going to lose it against green, then you probably want to analyze your deck structure a bit but yeah so good and the minus just to mill your opponent and exile the graveyard oh my goodness supremely good versus control <coughs> because control loves to reuse the graveyard you know opponents rust goes they keep cycling the good shit this will stop them and it's just great prismari command and Kerligan's command they're kind of like a nice pairing i love to use both of them deal two for ones which is just absurd um, sorry, I'm out of breath. Oh, I've spoken non-stop for like 20 minutes. So, two don't wish any target and kill an artifact. Which is weirdly the same as Killigan's command. It's weird how similar they are, actually, just looking at them. But most of the time with this, you'll be destroying a mana dork and an arcane signet. That's my favourite thing to do. If you're desperate, you'll be faithless looting, draw two, discard two, 
create a treasure. That's fine. Kelligan's Command, I very, very rarely return a creature from a graveyard to my hand. That is something I'll do if I'm desperately in need of creature. Most of the time, you'll be discarding artifacts, uh, destroying artifacts, or doing two. It's so versatile. If you watch the channel for a while, you'll see me uh, put a pause after the opponent's draw step in response to their first main phase where they can't respond. I'll use this to make them discard the card that is true and then do something else. And it ain't an instant they can't respond. So if they're top decking, they're, sh they're booked. Okay, they're booked. Crucius, not a paper card. Sad times. I was doing so well, but yes. It's just great. You know, discarding cards, including Winter Moon, if you don't want to use it. Ramp it up. Getting smaller things, getting big things, it's just really great. You all know that. Extinction Event, uh, useful for getting rid of a lot of hard targets. What do I mean by that? Just stuff with Hexproof, stuff with Indestructible, there's a few things. Get rid of them. It's quite niche, I would say. Languish is a nice counterpart, but the issue with Languish is, if they have 5 Toughness, you're screwed. So, I'd rather run the event, even if it only kills a few of their biggest things. Shieldred. Need I say more? Again, it's one of those boring cards that just fits in the deck. The fact she has five toughness is ludicrous. She survives so much stuff. Um, and you will just straight up kill people with this. It's absolutely ludicrous. Chandra, you know, one of the best red plane talkers. I'm going to say it of all time. I think probably the best red plane talker of all time. She's just really great for mid range cost. She ramps you into bigger things. She finds more spells with the top ability deals damage to your opponent deals damage to your opponent's creature and the ultimate is game ending she is so pushed uh four abilities as well i remember when this came out when i played standard and it was just crazy she is still crazy to this day rusko you all hate him or love him or both you know he's gonna be in the deck obviously prosper we all know prosper i mean a lot of these cards we get into territory we, we kind of know where it is now um but yeah, just getting more value from your deck. Aether Flux Reservoir, this, basically the synergy for this is with the Citadel. You can go pseudo-infinite with these two if you have these out because this gains your life for every spell you cast. Citadel, you lose life equal to the CMC of the spell you cast on top of your deck. But if you keep going, you'll be gaining life. And uh, you, I've won the game so many times with that. Reborn, classic, get rid of a creature. Again, kills hard targets, kills walkers, discards, brings stuff back, invoke despair. Probably... One of the, I can't say the best, but it's really, really crippling when you when you get this off. Just sacrifice three things. Stupid. Fires of Invention. This is my all-time super secret sexy tech. Play this and you never have to worry about your, your mana again. You just cast spells equal to or less than your CMC. You can do it twice per turn. You can't cast stuff in your opponent's turn. So you have to be very tactical when you play this. If you want to respond with other stuff, I recommend not casting it, obviously. But yeah, the cool thing about this is, people forget, if someone kills your bolus and you have Fire's Invention out, every time you cast bolus, you only ever have to pay the extra tax. So the next time you cast bolus with this out, it's just going to cost you two command attacks. And if they kill it or counter it, you do it again. You pay four, six, eight. But yeah, it basically makes your commander cost zero, which is a weird way of saying it but it's kind of what it does uh seven Gods command one of the best counters of all time i know i keep saying that but that's what the deck is the deck is basically all time greats you know you can return a permanent with this which is ri ridiculous i've returned land to people's hands slow them down kill that thing um you know you can kill someone's rusco minus three you can bounce their clock you can kill a planeswalker so great intimations as well the fact nobody uses these it kind of brings me a sense of joy because I think I've kind of I've been tapping into this secret mind that no one else knows the information to. But this is just look at the words on this. It's tiring to read it, right? Each opponent sacks a creature or walker, discards a card, then you return a creature or walker from your graveyard to your hand and draw a card. That's four different things already. And then if this is in your yard and you cast a bonus spike and exile this, your bonus comes in with more loyalty. What the fudge? So damn good. So damn good. <coughs> And if your opponent is top decking and they've got a creature out, you've just got rid of both those for, for one card. Stupid. Rivers of Rook, we know that. Crazy good. Onyx, my goodness. Onyx combined with Citadel, combined with Aetherflux as well. She's kind of like a second copy of Citadel. 
<coughs> pardon me, where you can just, I don't know, it, it just, she feels very similar because you're draining them over time. You're, you're getting stuff at the top of your deck. You're, I don't know. It's just so an insanely good. She's so good. Uh, Chandra is necessary against control decks. Sometimes you just can't break a counter mirror and resolving a Chandra is sometimes enough to just win you the game. It's just that good. The fact she can't be countered is a really sublime addition. I really appreciate that. Gives red a chance. Because if people like mono red and they keep playing blue, then they're just screwed. So stuff like this is really good sometimes. And the pressure she gives from the plus two one emblem each turn, it's very subtle, but it's very demoralizing and terrifying to see that emblem stack up. She's a board wipe. She's a targeted creature that's just so good. And then finally, Virtue of Persistence. Two mana to kill something, gain two, which is nice. And then a seven mana Shieldred, which is harder to kill than Shieldred. Um, the, I mean, the only downside is you're not... The thing is Shieldred is she makes your opponent sack, but she's a creature. So she dies to every single creature removal spot ever made. Virtue doesn't make your opponent sack. It only resurrects. So it's half a shieldred, but it's twice as hard to kill. So I think on top of a removal spell, that's pretty solid. Really great card. And just seeing as now, I might get one on eBay, but they are very, very expensive. So they're all the cards. And obviously, you know, Bolas, because you've been sat there for 20 minutes. Uh, the land, by the way, this will cost you a shitload of rares and mythics. So... You probably know that from watching my videos anyway. The lands are a complement of... We've got the fast lands, check lands. We've got the slow lands, scry lands, surveil lands, pain lands, and shock lands. So we're going to use every single one of those for every color combination. So there's three pairings of those. And we have the Zana's Lounge, Bloodstained Mire, Polluted Delta on tower so you could put more fetches in but the issue is that then what do you take out you know because having duels is is really nice and having fetch yeah fetches are great but we've already got two anyway and they can only fetch you know zana's lounge or savelle land it's up to you the lands are adjustable this is just my template but it served me really well it's just such a great it's such a great deck and i shouldn't I shouldn't really like Halcube, to be honest, because it goes against the grain of what I initially set out to do. But this is kind of like, a, this is a guilty pleasure for me, playing this deck. I, by no means, am saying that this is how everyone should build. But I do think it's important to see how the best people play, because that's how I've learned how to be a good Magic player. You only ever learn by playing the best. You will never learn by winning all the time against noobs. You have to push yourself as a person, as a player, just to see what it's like. And if you don't like Hell-Q, then so be it. But I think secretly most people do. It's not something I do all the time. Um, because clearly, you know, I've done 500 videos on the channel. 90% 90, 90 of them are not even uh, tier one. So bear that in mind if you have any criticisms about exposing the world to, to help you. I always laugh when people say, you're making the meta worse. I'm like, dude, I'm a tiny channel. I mean, yes, I, I have had a million views across all my videos, but even that's tiny compared to, you know, LVD and the big boys and girl, big girl out there. Um, I, I'm going to sneak in a little snarky remark, actually. I will do. I'm going to do it. But it, it does upset me when um other big youtubers say they are like the the de facto number one best thing i know it's a pr thing that people say that but it's just like come on acknowledge the competition a little bit um i'm talking about amazonian by the way she recently i've seen it in a few videos she always says like she's like the number one broad creator and stuff but then you have to think of all these extenuating circumstances like how did she, why is she at the top? Is she a pro player? You know, she's very large social f gathering and other things. She does streaming and she does all those other things, which is fair enough. You know, she's earned the following. People always think, oh, yeah, but whenever I have a criticism about other creators and stuff, people always say, oh, but they've earned, they've earned that following. I'm like, yeah, 
but I can still have, I can still critique and criticize when people just say stuff like, I don't know. It just makes me sad when people think they're the best because I've tried so hard to make it, you know, as a, as a YouTuber, but it is a lot of luck and it's a lot of politics and gender politics and corporate politics and all this stuff. And you can see the certain trends in media, which may favor certain people or things. And, you know, I don't really want to go too much into that, but it's just sad to think that I've been around just as long as Amazonian. You know, you can go back to my videos that, you know, I've been on the, on the platform for three and a half years, which is weirdly the same time she started. Um, it would, would just be nice to think that maybe other people were also also had intrinsic value rather than just seeing yourself as like this solitary platform where you kind of want to be a god. It's it's weird. Like celebrity is weird, right? Celebrity is like it's replaced religion in a way. You can see how people are so fanatic followers of certain people, things. And it does make me question like loyalties and just blindly following people. And it, it's a strange thing. I want to, I want people to like me and the channel because they get something from it where they think they can grow as a person or as a player. But when you see people just follow someone because of non game related stuff, stuff that's not even to do with magic, the gathering, then you just start to think, well, that doesn't feel very genuine. And that's something that I like to be, that I'm just being honest with you, you know, and I put, I tactically put my thoughts like this, um, deep in videos, because I know for a fact, most people won't get this far. Most people won't actually listen to this part. And you, you, the people that are here, you're getting the, the true essence of me and my channel and my thoughts. Um, you know, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to put this at the beginning of the video or, you know, I can see the stats. I know who's watching and where. So if I could put the most um, intimate thoughts where kind of like buried deep within the video, almost like an Easter egg. So if you listen to any of this and have an opinion on this, then I know you're uh, kind of like, you're interested in learning and my opinion. So thank you so much. But yeah, and, you know, after this deck tech, there's going to be some games. So this is going to be a tester video because I wanted to do a longer one because people jokingly said, oh, I have an eight hour video. I can't do an eight hour video. That's stupid. But I can do something like over an hour or something. So let's see how that goes. Enjoy the video. Huh. What is it, Atacan? Uh, hey, Snake. Have you thought about getting some more subs and some views? Yeah, we could do some new subs. How are they going to do that? Yeah, you can just do that below. Go ahead and click like and subscribe below. Okay, we're going against Grenzo, but I've already mulliganed twice. So. Let's put that away. Interesting to see if I can win a mulligan game, though. I probably would have quit if I hadn't seen Malcolm and or Search. Bauble, okay. Bauble. So they see the Bloodstained Mire. Okay. I know why more Bauble's in the deck. It's just, um, it always throws me off because it might, because it used to be used a lot in modern. Because it's basically four cards so you don't have to have in your deck. <coughs> Hex catch is pretty good, but yeah, probably not right now. And a clique. Okay. We've got two flashy boys here. Siren Pirate and Fairy Wizard. Interesting. Two flies. Completely different words on each. So depending on what happens here will depend on what we do. It's nice that we can complement the search for Scanter because this is going to be our secret fourth or fifth land. Yorgmoth. <clears throat> We're going to block Yorgmoth with the Vendelian Clique. Or we can just kill it with a Chandra, which is probably better, actually. Oh my gosh, Mana Drain on top. Okay. Yep. I'm doing surprisingly well considering I'm minus one card. 
But yeah, we just had such good support here. Let's see what we get with Malcolm. We'll discard that. It's good, but we need to be a lot more aggressive here. Hoping we can see <coughs> a victory. I'd like to see a victory, obviously, but... Seeing a victory from the back foot is a lot more interesting than seeing it when you're ahead. Everyone quits versus a Tell My Ragavan, right? That's that's not why you want to see my, my videos. Go for the throat, okay? Molten Collapse. Fair enough. Whatever. A lot of stuff going into a graveyard, though. Invoke Despair. Holy crap. That's just way too good to give up, right? Yeah. <clears throat> that was a really greedy keep for me. Especially when we don't even have, we don't even have the blue for these spells. <coughs> so, okay, we got the blue for the spells. Cool, bro. That almost went horribly wrong. I saw the blue in this artwork and I thought it was island. And they got the Yorgmoth back. Okay. So Yorgmoth comes down again. Not too worried about him. Let's see if we can find anything in their hand to get rid of. That's super good. You can tell when people haven't seen cards like this because they take a bit longer to read them. Long goodbye. So that's a, eliminate the company counter. Fair enough. We'll get to the rampage because that can deal with bolus. Nightmare. That takes it to seven. Nice. So the, the issue here is that um, we kind of want to get rid of <sighs> this is really tricky because if they resolve a Grenzo it's going to be really difficult to get around that. Let's just do the Invoke Despair here. Yeah, that made things kind of irritating but Oh, actually, we've got... So we've got the double blue for the Mana Drain, so it's actually not too bad now. Yeah, that was super lucky to get that blue source. Okay. So we can go for bonus, and we have some loads of mana left over as well. Fires. I outsmarted you so we can activate the Escanta. Whoa. What type is he? He's a ro goblin rogue. So we can take the power word kill. And let's check out any removal in the hand. Oh, they're probably going to quit now. Ooh, the power of a single duress. That could have gone hur horribly wrong with the breach of multiverse, giving them multiple things there. So, yes, that was very scary. They, it, that could have gone either way. So if we hadn't used the Invoke Despair, things could have gone very different there. Wow, this is a pretty stacked hand. Going against Rusko. So... I'm recording the gameplay after the one hour deck tech. So I'm already kind of flagging a bit. So forgive me if I make any mistakes. Let's see how we get on. So if we can counter the Rusko. Hmm. We'll see. Three mana. Let's go strike it rich. So we're going to get to a point where the Citadel should be able to dominate the game if we can resolve it. But. We'll see. They might see these treasures and think, oh, I've never I'd never used mana. Oh, okay, so it's gonna be one of those games. Ah, okay. Cool. So 
This is what a lot of control mirrors become. It becomes whoever breaks first. And if they break first, then they break first. But we have some great follow-ups. Oh, I love that. See, this is the one good thing about having the small, low-to-the-ground creatures. You just kind of send them into the flames of hell. They're just kind of like sacrificial. And then now I'm kind of saying, deal with it. Draw three, discard a card. So many variants of that. If they go for a Rusko, when it, so basically the next time they go for a Rusko, they're basically saying they have a backup. Feed the swarm. <clears throat> Let's, you know what? I'm actually going to try and counter this. Let them fight over a Magda. I mean, if they want to use two spells, go for it. Ooh, okay. So we get two colorless. <clears throat> They're definitely going to have a counter spell. They're definitely going to have one. Just trying to think of the ordering to do this. How much mana do we have? So we have 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Which means we can bait them with the Citadel. So they counter the Citadel. What if you have five? They might not have enough mana for the Dragon God. We'll see. Let's just see what they do here. Do they have two counters? Interesting. Now I feel like they're going to have My intellect is another answer for the bolus. But I wonder if it will be in conjunction with the Rusko or not. Yeah, man. So many little disruption spells and stuff, but we'll see. Six mana up. It's a real shame we, we lost the Citadel, Citadel, but sometimes it's just about acceptable losses, you know. Three mana up. Okay. Lightning Bolt. Uh, okay, well, we have two kill spots, so now we can just draw with the Nickel Bolas here. I absolutely love, like, just schooling Rusko players. So they're going to counter the Lightning Bolt. They're going to time twist it. That's even worse. I'm really tempted to give for the rift here. No, okay, fine. <clears throat> Looks like they might be scoring us. So it comes back in at the end step. That's actually quite annoying. That is actually quite annoying. The timing of that, I thought it was going to be instant. <coughs> Two clocks. Do we overload a rift here? <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. I mean, maybe that was a bad idea. Imprisoned in the moon. Well, that is annoying. They've got all the enchantment stuff. Okay. Okay. Well, could be worse. Hmm. <clears throat> Turning it into a land. That is pretty goddamn annoying, I have to say. I did not expect them to have two enchantments that did that. Chandra, okay. As if they've got two clocks, man. That's crazy. I'm Chandra, the immolation sensation. Let's take out Rusko, please. Ooh, exploded. 
<clears throat> they can cast him over and over and over again. This is the issue with Rusko. But... And they've got multiple clocks going off. We need to... Essentially, we need to find Narset really badly. Another clock. Jeez. Four, five, six, seven mana open. I hate the way that our bonus is trapped in this moon. Yeah, that is annoying. But there's not much we can do. They've got four clocks. The thing is, they're all in sequence. They're going to lose a lot of cards. Oh, Culligan's come on. Two and four. Okay. So at least now we can just start upticking the Chandra. And then... We'll see. The Kelligan's Command might have some interesting applications here. Because <clears throat> we might want to destroy one of their clocks. At some point, but then they've got so many. I've never seen so many clocks in my goddamn life. What's in the graveyard? Hmm. Tasha. Do we have any creatures in our graveyard? We have zero, so currently they're just not going to be able to do too much there. When I win, I'd love people. Interestingly, they looked in their own graveyard. Wait, what? We don't have a creature in our graveyard. What? Thanks for the help. Okay, well they've pretty much slipped up there then, and the gate goes on top. Uh, we'll make them discard, and then kill the Tasha. Let's see what they do in response here. They've got two cards in the hand. Are there going to be more counter spells? If they counter this with a card in the hand, then the intimations might resolve a bit easier. We'll see. Sublime Epiphany. Okay. And the gate goes on top of the deck. Huh. That's strange. So they're probably going to have an extra turn thing in their hand, aren't they? Galvanic Discharge. Let's go for the Intimations then. Rewind. Ashiok. Oh my god! Oh my god. That is exactly what I wanted to see. Okay, that is huge. That is monumental. Let's see if they know how Chandra works here. Try and negate it. No? Okay, nice one. I cannot believe that. We also have the Galvanic Discharge as well. So Discharge can just kill the Rusko when it comes out again. That was monumental. Four clocks. That's the biggest amount of clocks I've ever seen. They're going to negate that. I can tell this Rusko player kind of fresh, kind of a fresh Rusko player. Negating that rather than holding it for something more important. That is a strange move. Even with that Arbolas here, we're still kind of doing pretty good. Rusko, and we have an answer for that as well. They are going to rage quit. Oh, this is going to be gorgeous with the Ashiok as well. Ashok's going to get rid of every single uh, ridiculous card they've used. Tick up again. They're going to have to fight this. Hope it's not too hot for you. Let's see what we get rid of here. Big for your life. Oh, just loads of counters and bounce spells. Okay, nice. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they're two off Rusko. They're taking three a turn with the Chandra. We have a Castle Lock Thwain, which is just... It ain't over yet. 
Liliana of the Veil. Okay, so they're gonna, if they make them discard, that's gonna be one fewer. And this is exactly why we don't use the castle till end of their turn. Thought distortion, completely useless. I wonder what the last card is. Land. Malcolm. I would say it would have been tempting to kind of let them keep the lily to disrupt their own hand, but let's just try and kill her here. Because we don't want them we don't want to risk them ultimating her, for instance. Nice. Man, this Ashok is doing some damage here. Get rid of Oh, 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 mass manipulation as well. That would have been horrendous if that had resolved. So we don't have to worry too much about losing our stuff now. We're going to try and get the midnight clock to flip as soon as possible. Down to 10. Hive of the Eye Tyrant is going to come out. Let's just get the Malcolm out and draw a card with the Castle Lock Thwain just in case there's something we can kill the Hive with. Because I kind of want to just... No, okay, sadly we don't have a way to kill it. <clears throat> They're going to get rid of the Ashok. Interesting. They're more worried about the Ashiok. Man, their cards are just... Demir, awesome stuff. That's what we expect in these ranks. Witness protection, yet another. Yeah, we're going to struggle to deal with this midnight clock if it gets to go off. Wow, we get such for Scanter though. Let's get <coughs> okay, so let's say, in theory, the clock goes off and they get extra turn spells. They're going to be taking extra damage. Eight. I just can't see them making us out alive. I just can't see it. <coughs> Rusko. Straw card. Come on now. I mean, luckily we have all these other things that help us win, but... Ten. One, two, three mana. If they do that, they're not going to have anything left. We're going to be able to flip. Oh, Eldest Reborn as well. <clears throat> yeah, they're just screwed, right? Is it just me, or is it getting a little warm in here? Like, there's literally nothing they can do. They're going to lose the Rusko. We're going to smack them for one, then they're going to take five in their upkeep. But I'm very glad that we actually found this uh, opponent to kind of show off cards in our deck. And let's just use this here in case, because maybe we can find something like, no, sadly not. I was hoping for like a lightning bolt or thought seize. <coughs> if they had summary dismissal, they could counter all these abilities. They're going to consider it in response. To try and find a way to counter these. They're going to try and find a way from our deck. Cool. To be fair, that's a good play. Because they probably know there's nothing in theirs that can stop 5 damage on the stack. I don't think we have anything in our deck that can actually... <laughs> They're going to dig again. Okay, fine. Is there anything in our deck that can stop Chandra dealing all that damage? Hmm. Well, they've only got five mana now anyway, so... Brazen Borrower. Okay, well that's not going to stop it either. Oh, I love to see the desperation here. It's just very amusing. Oh, beautiful. But, yeah, there we go. Took out a risk of player. That was pretty tough, though, I have to say. They were... 
all about these. The issue with Rusco is it doesn't really reward smart plays because the clocks going up isn't part of a process that they have to do. The clocks would go up either way. They just, you play a Rusco and it just automatically levels up the clocks, right? On your upkeep, regardless if you've cast them with spells. So it's almost like they made Rusco for people that aren't that good at control. Compare that to my deck, where I'm desperately trying to find the answer for a solution. So my deck is trying to find a specific answer to a specific solution, aka the Midnight Clocks. Their deck is just draw seven cards, and hopefully one of those is the solution. But here's all the solutions at once. So it's kind of like uh, an abundance of choice. Yeah, it's a very interesting card that they designed. And I'm interested in the design philosophy of it. And it would be nice to kind of discuss with the person that made Rusko to see what their intent was. Because I don't think it really matches the original intent of Control Deck's other thinking man's deck. Rusko is just Rusko and 60 non-creature spells. Um and that's not to say, you know, I'll use one in my deck too, but because it's so easy to get off, right? I don't use it because of any other reason. It's just, I use it because it's the easy choice. But the easy choice isn't always the most fun, in my opinion. Ah, there we go. Did you know that you can help my channel by watching another one of my videos? Go ahead, you know you want to.